Today, no one needs to be convinced that we are living in an increasingly unstable and angry world. But the question many ask is, why? Actually, it's a fulfillment of Bible prophecy. Not that God is the one that causes these attitudes. However, His Word did foretell what attitudes would be in the last days. I'd like to invite you to turn in your Bibles to 2 Timothy chapter 3, and notice what those attitudes are. 2 Timothy chapter 3, and we're going to read verses 1 through 3. Chapter 3, verse 1 says, But know this, that in the last days, critical times, hard to deal with, will be here. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, haughty, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, disloyal, having no natural affection, not open to any agreement, slanderers, without self-control, fierce, without love of goodness. Yes, we see those attitudes prevalent in society today. Perhaps you have been the victim of an injustice caused by someone displaying those very attitudes. If so, how did you react? Some individuals react feeling that they have to be violent, which only perpetuates violence. In many parts of the world, we see that injustice is a viewpoint that merits violence on their part. For example, Joseba, who lives in Spain, was asked why he became a member of a militant group. The oppression and injustice we suffered at the time became unbearable, he said. I was arrested one morning expressing my feelings about police tactics. I was so angry I wanted to do something, even resorting to violence, to try to remedy the situation. Hafeni was an individual born in Zambia and grew up in refugee camps in neighboring countries. He said, I was furious at the brutal and unfair way my family and others had been treated, so I became part of a militant group, the same militant group my parents belonged to. Our land was taken from us by exploitation. Animals fight for their territory, so it seemed natural for us to fight for our land and our rights. So here we see individuals, they responded, they were angry. They were willing to take a violent course to try and seek a remedy. Others are affected. In the angry and unstable world we have, much anger and violence is perpetuated in the entertainment industries. And as individuals absorb this into their minds, they find themselves becoming agitated maybe even move to violence themselves because of what they see in movies, in video games, sometimes sporting events, and yes, even music, can foment, bring up those emotions, those reactions. Then there are individuals who seek to escape from the situation today. They try to escape by means of drugs or alcohol only to find that those things bring out a cruel aspect of their personality. And then there are individuals who are dissatisfied with the governments under which they live because of the failure to provide for the needs of the people. So therefore, to express their viewpoint, they feel like they have to result to acts of violence, sometimes even terrorism, in which only innocent individuals feel the brunt of it. So the question comes about, living in a world that's increasingly unstable and angry, how can we keep from becoming consumed by anger? Perhaps we need to adopt a different viewpoint. For many, their viewpoint is what James chapter 3 verse 15 describes as earthly, animalistic, and demonic. But instead of those traits, we need to have God's viewpoint of the situation. What is God's viewpoint? Well, to find out, let's go to his word, the Bible. I'd like to invite you to turn in your Bibles to Psalm 37. And notice the inspired words here. 
It gives us insight to how Jehovah God feels about what's taking place today. Chapter 37, verse 10. It says, Just a little while longer, and the wicked will be no more. You will look at where they were, and they will not be there. But the meek will possess the earth, and they will find their exquisite delight in the abundance of peace. See, there's God's viewpoint. Jehovah hates injustice. And so for these individuals who are wicked, seeking injustice, angry, perpetuating violence, it says they will be no more. In fact, you can look at where they were, and they won't be there. But notice the hope. The meek will possess the earth, and they will find their exquisite delight in the abundance of peace. Yes, this is Jehovah's remedy to the injustice, to the anger, to the violence that we see in the world today. But how does he do that? Well, I can tell you how he does not do it. He does not do it by means of some political solution or by some protest seeking to bring justice. That's not his way. Instead, Jehovah God is going to use his son, Jesus Christ, to bring about this peace to the earth. In fact, it was prophesied. I'd like to invite you to turn over just a few pages to Psalm 72. In Psalm 72, beginning with verse 13, there it says, He will have pity on the lowly and the poor, and the lives of the poor he will save. From oppression and from violence he will rescue them, and their blood will be precious in his eyes. Imagine that. Here we're talking about a ruler, Jesus Christ, who will have pity on the lowly and the poor, not exploit them. It said, in the lives of the poor he will save. And then notice the promise, from oppression and from violence he will rescue them. He will rescue them. No political system, no protest movement. Jehovah is going to do this by means of his Son. What a wonderful hope we have for the future. But when is this going to happen? Zephaniah chapter 2 verse 2 refers to this time as the day of Jehovah's anger. Now make no mistake, Jehovah's anger is never abusive. It's always justified, never excessive. Unlike human anger, Jehovah's acts will result in abundant peace earthwide. But to benefit, we have to seek God, and we have to observe his righteous decrees by cooperating with Jehovah's way of correcting injustice. That's why we have to be a peacemaker, one who conquers evil with good. Jehovah helps us to do this by giving us sound guidance and counsel in his word, the Bible. Again, to find out where, I'd like to invite you to turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter 12. We're going to consider a few verses here. In Romans chapter 12, we're going to read verses 18 through 21. If possible, as far as it depends on you, be peaceable with all men. Do not avenge yourselves, beloved, but yield place to the wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says Jehovah. But if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink, for by doing this you will heap fiery coals on his head. Do not let yourself be conquered by the evil, but keep conquering the evil with the good. Here are the steps that can help us not to become consumed by anger when we're living in such an angry world. Some may say, is it practical? Is it easy? Well, in order to apply these verses, we really need to understand them. So let's go back through them one by one. Verse 18. If possible, as far as it depends on you, be peaceable with all men. Here we can see that the emphasis is on us individually, and that's true. We cannot control what others do, what they say, what they think. 
but we have control over what we do, what we say, and what we think. So we have to make a choice to be peaceable with all men. Now, that's not always easy when you're in the company with individuals who are angry. And that's the point of the counsel at Proverbs chapter 22, verses 24 and 25. There it wisely tells us, Do not keep company with a hot-tempered man, or get involved with one disposed to rage, so that you never learn his ways and ensnare yourself. Isn't that good counsel? Think about it. If you're in the company with someone who is agitated, maybe angry, maybe even goes into a fit of rage, does that make you feel more calm? Hardly. Usually the emotions start welling up and you start feeling frustration and anger and can go into a rage. Why? Because it's the environment that you're in. It's a reaction. And that's the reason the scripture is so good. It says, not to be in company with these individuals so that you do not learn his way and become ensnared. So we need to guard our association. Avoid association with people who lash out in anger or who advocate violence. Now, going to the next verse, 19. Do not avenge yourselves, beloved, but yield place to the wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says Jehovah. Retaliation is self-destructive. It feeds the cycle of hatred. Instead of retaliating, we need to strengthen our faith in Jehovah God. See what the promise is here? He says you don't have to avenge yourself. Vengeance is mine. It belongs to Jehovah. Then he promises, I will repay. I'm going to take care of the injustices that you suffer. So we have to leave it with Jehovah. A wonderful example of that was Jesus Christ himself. The Apostle Peter spent much time with Jesus when Jesus was on the earth. He saw how he responded to various situations. And so he could say what we read at 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 23. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 23. And here, with freeness of speech, notice what Jesus said was described as. It says, when he was being insulted, he did not insult in return. When he was suffering, he did not threaten. Notice, but he entrusted himself to the one who judges righteously. You see, when Jesus was insulted, he didn't seek vengeance. When Jesus was suffering, he did not seek vengeance. But he entrusted himself to the one who judges righteously. In application of this scripture, he knew that his father would repay. We can have that confidence as well. Imitate Jesus, who had confidence that Jehovah will avenge unjust treatment. Now, returning to Romans chapter 12, let's continue with our verses there. Romans chapter 12, next verse is 20. But if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink, for by doing this you will heap fiery coals on his head. See, here we're told to do good, even to our enemy. And that's what we want to do, is seek ways of doing good to others, which may include our enemies. A wonderful example of this is at the beginning of a war, a young soldier made rapid advancement in the elite unit of the Croatian army. In 1994, while waiting for a train, he received a brochure, a pamphlet, that was entitled, Who Really Rules the World? He eagerly read that tract. He learned that Satan is responsible for the violence committed against man and that it is not Jehovah God, and this had a profound effect upon him, even as a soldier. You see, he had become a soldier because he wanted to avenge the death of his 19-year-old sister and two members of his family who had been killed in the war. His intent was to go to the village of those who killed his family and seek vengeance. But after reading that tract, it caused him to pause. He started studying the Bible, 
And after two years of progressively making his mind over, taking Jehovah's viewpoint of matters, he was baptized in 1997. Eventually he did go to the village where the killers of his family lived, but not to seek vengeance. He was happy to take the good news of God's kingdom to people who needed to learn about God's mercy. What a beautiful application of that scripture. If your enemy is hungry, feed him. So we can appreciate the wisdom of this. But this is also a nice application of the following or the next verse. Notice in verse 21, Do not let yourself be conquered by the evil, but keep conquering the evil with the good. So here we have wise counsel. Do not let yourself be conquered by the evil. We look at this and we might think that that's not easy to do. Don't let yourself be conquered by the evil. That's difficult if you've been the victim of some sort of injustice. Sometimes we may feel like we're powerless against those who have perpetuated injustice against us. Perhaps we have been oppressed by individuals, and we can't do anything about it, so that frustration builds within us. This is where we have to be careful, not to allow that frustration to be acted out upon those who love us, our friends and our family. If we even feel that those feelings are dwelling up in our heart, then we need to consult a mature friend, one who shares God's viewpoint as based on his word, the Bible. They will give us the support we need so as not to give in to such frustration and do hurtful things to those that we love. Pray to Jehovah. Pray that he may give you peaceful thoughts. Pray that he can give you compassion. Pray that he will help you to exercise the next part of the verse which says, but keep conquering the evil with the good. Yes, that's our goal. Be willing to forgive others. Even when there's a basis to do so, it may not be easy. But why is it important? Again, turning in our Bibles to the book of Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 31. Ephesians 4.31 says, Put away from yourselves every kind of malicious bitterness, anger, wrath, screaming, and abusive speech, as well as everything injurious. But become kind to one another, tenderly compassionate, freely forgiving one another, just as God also by Christ freely forgave you. Not one of us does not need the forgiveness that God gives. We appreciate Jehovah's forgiveness by means of his son, Christ Jesus. So doesn't it move us to be freely forgiving of others? Freely forgiving. Not I'll forgive you if, or I'll forgive you, but freely forgiving. Sometimes that's not easy. But when we look at these verses in Romans chapter 12, verses 18 through 21, are they practical? Can that be done? Is it effective? Can these scriptures help us to cultivate peace in an angry world? Well, consider this experience. In June 1998, three white men attacked and killed James Byrd Jr., who was a black man. I won't relate the details of how this was done, but at the time in the news, it was labeled as the most horrific hate crime of the decade. Three of James Byrd's sisters are Jehovah's Witnesses. How did they feel about the perpetrators of this horrible crime? In a joint statement, they said this, Having a loved one tortured and lynched produced an unimaginable sense of loss and pain. How does one respond to such a brutal act? Retaliation, hateful speech, or promotion of hate-ridden propaganda never entered our mind. Instead, we thought, what would Jesus have done? How would he have responded? And the answer was crystal clear. His message would have been one of peace and hope. What an amazing attitude. 
What helped them? Among the scriptural references that helped these Christian women to prevent hate from developing in their hearts was the very scriptures we were just discussing. Romans chapter 12, verses 18 through 21. They continued, We recall the realistic statements made in our publications that some injustices or crimes are so horrendous. It will be harder to say, I forgive you, and just walk away. Forgiveness in such instances could be just letting go of the resentment so that one can move on with one's life and not become physically or mentally ill because of harboring resentment. What an eloquent testimony to the power of God's Word, the Bible, and His Holy Spirit to keep deep-seated hate from taking root in one's heart. Yes, the Bible, along with the power of God's Spirit, can help all of us to avoid allowing hate to take root in our heart. Go to Jehovah in prayer. Ask Him to give us compassionate thoughts instead of angry ones, to be peaceful with all men. Cultivating such peace leads to blessings in our life. Many have applied Bible principles on peaceableness and have benefited from the results. One benefit is that they have broken free from a violent course. Remember Hafeni that we spoke about earlier in the talk? How did he change his viewpoint? Remember, he was deeply affected by racial injustice. Hafeni began to examine his own religious beliefs acquired a copy of the Bible, and this is what he said. I started by examining the Gospels, the Bible books of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, which contained the life story of Jesus. As I read, I was quickly attracted to the personality of Jesus, his kind and impartial way of dealing with people. It warmed my heart. He said one passage from the Bible really hit home. Acts chapter 10, verses 34 and 35. That's where it says, Now I truly understand that God is not partial, but in every nation the man who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. I concluded that it is people themselves who are responsible for tribalism, nationalism, and racial prejudices. I came to realize that the Bible's message can change people's thinking, their viewpoint, and that the most important thing in life is having a good standing with God. This is more important than fighting in behalf of people of a particular tribe, race, or color. And remember Hoseba? He was the head of a small commando unit that was about to attack a police station. But before he could do that, he was arrested, spent two years in prison. Shortly after that, his wife Lucy began studying the Bible with Jehovah's Witnesses. And after his release, Hoseba would also sit in on those discussions. This is what he said. As I learned more about Jesus, he became my role model. One of his statements really touched me, namely, All those who take the sword will perish by the sword. I knew this was true. Hoseba acknowledged assassinating someone only provokes hatred and a desire for revenge by family members. And then he said this, Violence brings only pain, not a better world. Hafeni and Hoseba learn through personal experience that the Bible teaching can change one's viewpoint and powerfully affect one's life. Additionally, being peaceable brings blessings in another way. For example, Proverbs 14.30 says, A calm heart brings life to the body. Medical science is appreciating the truth of this also. It's known that individuals who get into heated anger can trigger a stroke or even a heart attack, and that those with heart disease, that getting very angry 
is like taking poison. One medical journal said this, Getting really mad can mean getting really sick. However, God's Word tells us that those who pursue peace can develop a calm heart. It also benefits our relations with others. I'd like to invite you to go to Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, found in Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, and we're going to read two verses here. Matthew 5, 5 says, Happy are the mild-tempered, since they will inherit the earth. And then verse 9, Happy are the peacemakers, since they will be called sons of God. Did you notice in both cases they were happy because they were peacemakers, because they were mild-tempered? Andy, who serves as an elder in New York City, knows the truthfulness of this. He grew up in a very aggressive, violent neighborhood. In fact, in his life, he says that at the young age of eight, he was put into the boxing ring and taught how to fight. And he said he didn't view his opponents as people. His one thought was hit or be hit. He eventually joined a gang, got involved in street fights and brawls. And he said that his relationships were troublesome and based on fear. What helped Andy to become a peaceable person? He said this, One day I went to a meeting at a Kingdom Hall of Jehovah's Witnesses, and I could immediately sense the loving spirit among the people there. Since then, my association with these peace-loving people has helped me to develop a calm heart, and it eventually melted away my old way of thinking. I have made many lasting friendships. Like Hafeni, Hoseba, and Andy, victims of injustice cannot change the past, but they can look forward to a bright future. What is that future? I'd like to invite you to return to Psalm 37. And in Psalm 37, we read verses 10 and 11, but let's go back and read verses 8 and 9. Psalm 37, verse 8. Let go of anger and abandon rage. Do not become upset and turn to doing evil, for evil men will be done away with. But those hoping in Jehovah will possess the earth. What wonderful counsel, what powerful incentive to cultivate peace in an angry world. We invite you to continue studying your Bible, continue adjusting your viewpoint to Jehovah's viewpoint, continue associating with Jehovah's Witnesses, so that you too may hope in Jehovah and enjoy an abundance of peace.